Good morning, Cindy. Good morning, Craig. Good morning. Hello. Um, it's it's really lovely to to see you. Um, as as I was saying just before, the last time I saw you was, I think, in 2011 for the Russell Tribunal in Palestine in New York. So so it's been quite a while. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really lovely to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Frank. It's good to see you again. I'm. Um, I mean, I, I I love seeing you again and, and talking to you. Uh, but um, unfortunately, it's. Uh, I guess not for the right reasons. Um, Gaza is being genocided as we speak. Um, it's been nearly a year now, and. Um, like last week, a few, a couple of, a few days ago, um, Aishinu Egi was uh, killed by an um, Israeli soldier, and um, unfortunately, it, I guess it brings you back to what happened to Rachel in twenty uh, in two thousand and three, um, and it brings, I guess, you know, Jocelyn Herndl, Herndl back to uh, what happened to Tom Herndl also in 2003 and it reminds us that um, it looks like no one is safe right now I mean no one who wants to take a stand for, for justice um, and, and you know equality for the Palestinians is, is safe um, I was wondering if, if it's okay with you if we can go back um, what was Rachel doing in Gaza um, and, and why why did she want to go? I, I don't want to talk about this for too long, but I would just want to give people a bit of context. So, yeah, what was she doing in Gaza and, and why did she want to go? Like Aishinur, Rachel was uh, a student, you know, at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. She was had completed her education, was getting ready to graduate. Uh, she had become very involved in the anti-war movement as the U.S. approached war with Iraq, also with Afghanistan earlier, but um, the, the community had new peace organizations forming when the U.S. response to 9-11 had been war. And so there were uh, uh, Olympians for Peace in the Middle East, OMJP, and uh, old organizations like FOR where people became very active and that was at a you know critical time in her education she connected with those community groups and then uh, friends of hers uh, went to what was called Freedom Summer the first uh, summer that there was a call from Palestinians and from uh, internationals who were supporting them to bring activists to Palestine, to the West Bank, to Gaza, to stand with Palestinians who wanted to resist what was happening at that time and to do it nonviolently. And some of her friends went in the summer of, of 2002. She followed that very closely. She worked with them when they returned. She was studying Arabic. Um, and she felt and that 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 what was happening in the West Bank and Gaza inside Israel at that time was connected to everything else that was happening in the region and that uh, had possibly even been a reason for why 9-11 uh, happened in the United States, one of the reasons. And so uh, there were people on campus who had spent a lot of time in the West Bank, faculty members. She connected with a lot of people to learn all she could and then determined that she could she could also go and participate with the International Solidarity Movement, ISM, Palestinian-led movement. At the time, what I remember is there were only two requirements for being a part of ISM, and that was that you believed in freedom for the Palestin Palestinian people and that you agreed to engage only in nonviolent resistance. So um, that's... That's what drew her. I think, um, you know, like many young people, Rachel was looking for meaningful things to do with her life. And uh, 
things changed very dramatically uh, for students, I think, during, during that period, as it has for students now, you know, across the world, but also across the U.S., as they've watched uh, the terrible uh, situation develop for this past year in Gaza. I'd only add to that Th that thank you, Cindy. Uh, yeah. the U.S. State Department at the time listed Rachel as a human rights observer. It's my understanding, I'm not a lawyer, but that there are other additional protections for human rights observers. Certainly what we know about Eisenhower, she was way behind the group looking on. She was a human rights observer as well. So there's, there's that connection of uh, being there to observe, to try to, uh, if they can't keep the violence against the Palestinians down, then uh, at least report it to the world so the world hears about it. By the way, Craig and Cindy, I don't know if, if like your video quality, like if you see me clearly and stuff, but if you, if you don't sometimes, it's not a problem. Uh, the, the video at the end will be like perfect. I just wanted you to, to be aware of that. So, um, so don't, don't worry about it. Um, and I'll cut this obviously from, from the interview. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, also like when, when Rachel told you she wanted to go, um, how, how did you feel at the time? Uh, she, she was very careful about it. She let it, she had a conversation with me this summer, uh, before she went and, uh, I started looking for other things that she might do. You know, it, it was an issue that, um, our family of course had known about for forever. It was always there, but it wasn't one that we were tied to directly in any way. And we had... I had so much to learn, and uh, we had uh, f we have family members from India, and so I started googling, you know, looking. Uh, I don't I don't know if we Google Googled then or if we had some other means, but I was using my computer. Uh, I was living in we were living in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time because of a job change. Rachel was in Olympia, Washington, but I was looking for places that she could go and do things that would um, satisfy her needs, meet her needs uh, for meaningful work in the world, uh, but also where she could be assisted by extended family or connections that we had, where, where I felt that she might be safer. Um, but uh, it, what I didn't realize is uh, not being in Olympia at the time, just how um, integrated into the, the movement there, the peace movement there, and into all of those actions I described earlier that were happening locally uh, to try to stop the war with Iraq. And then um, having these close friends who had come back from the international solidarity movement. So um, there was certainly anxiety and uh, on our part, uh, but she was, you know, I, 23 years old, um, going on 24 at the time, uh, we always felt, you know, our kids needed to find their own paths forward. And, uh, and, and our role was to try to understand and to support that. And uh, she clearly had. And um, I would say that I remember, we remember both of us, the first phone call that we got from Rachel from Gaza which was, I believe, from the home that she stood in front of, the Nasrallah home, and people wanting her to be in touch with her parents, Palestinians wanting her to be in touch with her family. And, um, and I could hear trembling in her voice. She said, can you hear that? Can you hear that? And Craig could describe it better than I, but you could hear the shelling coming. At, it was during the night, uh, you know, towards these homes that were still remaining. Already many homes had been destroyed, but these homes that were still remaining uh, along the border with Egypt, actually, along the Philadelphia corridor. And uh, I remember that when we got off the phone, Craig and I didn't say a word to each other. Uh, I, I was fearful. But then as as we got more news about what she was doing, you know, we grew more comfortable. And clearly she was understanding better 
um, what was happening there and what she needed to do. So, you know, I, I would say that um, there was sort of a false security. And then as we got closer to March of that year, uh, into March, um, she started talking about coming home in her emails to us. And so that's what we were focused upon. I mean, since since Rachel's death, you've been working nonstop, um, you know, in a fight for justice and accountability. I'm sure one of the reasons you've been working so much um, for Rachel, in a way, to get some kind of some kind of justice, is to avoid other, I guess, internationals, because unfortunately, Palestinians die every minute nowadays but um, so to avoid for any other internationals to face the same fate as as Rachel um, so how I mean how did you feel when you heard about Aisha Nur's death um, a few days ago I think it was it was devastating to hear about Eisenhower's killing um, because it takes us back. We knew what that family would face. Uh, that pain is searing. It's different for each individual, even within a family, uh, but it's also the same. So we knew what they'd be going through simply from the loss. And then you have it in an international situation. It's uh, a, a very specific kind of hill that in the worst day of your life, it's also the most public day of your life. So our hearts went out to them, but also, uh, as you maybe suggest a little bit, anger, anger first at the Israelis, that they're continuing to kill people. I, and, uh, and then also anger as you start to hear the U.S. State Department with the same platitudes that we've heard over and over again as, um, as U.S. citizens are killed. That is, that, some of that speech has changed for the better. And so I, I'm hopeful that the U.S. government will do more now than they have before. I think if you talk to each individual in our family, uh, that we have s sort of different things that we're saying about the la what we did in the last 20 years. I felt from the beginning that you had to talk about finding justice for Rachel. But Rachel was dead. There's no finding justice for Rachel. So I felt like we were, we were working to keep the other, like you said, the other internationals from being killed. And, uh, and they kept being killed and the reaction of the U.S. government kept being the same. So uh, that pain continues, but also the Palestinians. You can't work on this issue. You can't work on somebody else's issue for two decades. It has to become your own. So when we first went to Gaza and met the people that Rachel uh, introduced us to by email, uh, they were already old friends in some sense. I remember when Rachel was killed, wanting to tell the Palestinians in Gaza, in, in Rafa, thank you, which is a strange sort of thing. But when we could not be parents to Rachel, it was clear that these Palestinian families were parents to Rachel. They loved her and uh, would, even if they had to pantomime, they would communicate with her that love and try to take care of her. Um, there's just an amazing international community in our world that is caring and loving. And, and uh, it's, it's also so disappointing that so many people don't, they fear the other rather than embrace them because it's a wonderful world when you embrace the other. I... I would just add that, um, you know, Craig and I are at this moment 76 and 77 years old. And uh, we've been trying for a couple of years to figure out how do we uh, wind down some of the work. And uh, I remember, you know, on October 7th, knowing immediately that we were going to be facing another long, terrible stretch. Had no idea that we'd still be talking about what was happening in Gaza continuing a year later and would have seen the unbelievable horror that is Gaza right now. 
Uh, but uh, again, there are these moments, and Aisha Noor, the, the news when it came to us on Friday morning of Aisha Noor's killing was another one of those moments where, no, there there isn't ability to, to just sit back and stop. I mean, there's, there's another family that's facing this. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're, you know, hearing all year long, I've been hearing reports from other families that we know in Gaza um, who have lost multiple family members, you know, so the, um, it's, it's a very difficult moment that we're all in. And I think that we, we just have to hope and pray that, um, that, that we've seen some of the worst of it and that uh, the world is waking up and that there will be changes. And as Craig said, um, a, a lot of our focus is trying to support uh, Aisha Nura's family as, uh, it, to, it, when they've asked for that support and the people that are supporting them in thinking about what do we want from the U.S. government? Um, what do we want from the Israeli government? What, what, and certainly listening to what the family says they need and want, but um, also looking at the history of how these kinds of um, killings of American citizens and of many others, um, what the responses have been and trying to see if we can move the, move the dial on all of that is very important to us. Yes, the, I, I wanted to ask you about this because the uh, the State Department's response to any killings, it seems, even of Americans, but also of, of Palestinians, is we trusting our partners in Israel to conduct a, a thorough investigation about this. And then they wait, wait, wait for months and months and months and, and nothing happens. We've heard that from Aisha Noor's family that no one called them from the U.S. government, the U.S. State Department. Um, and I remember, actually, when Ra Rachel died, that the U.S. Um, and Israel said that Israel were going to change their rules of engagement when it came to demonstrations. And, and we see now, 20, more than 20 years later, that nothing has changed. Um, I was wondering, like, What's, what's your, in a way, what happened in terms of accountability for Rachel, if anything? And who do you hold, in a way, responsible for Rachel's death and Aisha Noor's death? Well, of course, we pursued what the world would see as justice for Rachel in, in a number of different ways. And as you point out, the most logical way was through... Uh, international diplomacy. But I do remember being in the State Department and talking to Colin Powell's chief of staff, Lawrence B. Welkerson, a, months, a few months after Rachel was killed. And they are telling us that from the President of the United States talking to uh, Prime Minister Sharon at the time and being promised a, quote, thorough, credible, and transparent investigation, end quote, into Rachel's killing with a, uh, the re results to be told to the U.S. government. Um, but beyond that, uh, various people at very high levels of our government uh, communicating to their counterparts. But also, the United States at the same time had sent another extra billion dollars to Israel. So I asked Larry Wilkerson, I said, which do you think they hear? Your letters or the billion dollars? Because I got a hunch they hear the billion dollars and they don't you can write all the letters you want to, but if we send more aid after killing a U.S. citizen, that's all they pay attention to. I think that's proved true over the following decades. And so the only way to get any sort of accountability here is to cut off aid, which is required by U.S. law. So all we have to do is obey our own laws and be rational about this sort of thing. And, uh, in, and I think things would change. And they have to change for the Palestinians as well. I remember we were involved very early in going to Congress. And we were being helped by uh, a group in the United States. And we were told by uh, their young person that was helping us that uh, we could talk in Congress 
about the cause of Rachel, but we could not speak about Rachel's cause. In other words, we could talk about a U.S. citizen being killed by the Israeli military, but not so much about why she was there. That wasn't completely true, but we learned pretty quickly that what we had to do is introduce ourselves talking about uh, Rachel being killed. And, uh, and I think that some of that's changing from what I hear, and certainly the response of uh, our senators, which are Eisenhower's senators and uh, Eisenhower's congressmen, uh, who worked, all those people worked with us over the 20 years on this issue. Their, their response is immediate and not trusting Israelis, trusting the eyewitnesses that were there and the reports that are coming out, which are consistent uh, if you don't listen to the Israeli military. And they want answers. And of course, they're putting that in writing to the State Department. And the State Department is required to at least answer their questions. So I'm hopeful that there can be some change and I'm hopeful that people will drive that far enough so that there is actually consequences to the Israeli government. And the only one I can think of is to, uh, to stop our military support with munitions and equipment and money going on and also stopping our um, protection in the UN and other international uh, bodies. Uh, because this needs to be dealt with on an international level, and the United States needs to get on with that along with other countries. I know in the UN, uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield has stated that the, the U.S. is outraged about Eisenhower's killing, and there, it didn't start that way in the first hours, but since, uh, since she's been killed, the language has changed and become uh, stronger on the part of uh, Secretary of State Blinken, I think on the part of even President Biden uh, at this point. So, uh, so we're, we're, we're hopeful uh, that the message is getting through. But, um, but we had a lot of support from the same people, uh, from, from people in the State Department, from other, others in government through the years. And when you asked about what happened in Rachel's case in terms of accountability, um, you know, after uh, two years, uh, we, we were told by the State Department, Chief of Staff to Colin Powell, that he could say without equivocation that there had not been a thorough, credible, and transparent investigation in Rachel's case. At that point, we were faced with statutes of limitations. We had also been told that... Uh, by by Mr. Wilkerson, who was very helpful to us through the years, if uh, if it were his daughter, he would sue them at that point, and so we did, you know, pursue legal action, and we spent many years. At the The Israeli system, legal system, is very different from what happens here in the U.S. So it was many years, and there were efforts on the part of the Israeli government to stop those kinds of lawsuits. So. Uh, it, it took a very long time, and of course the courts found uh, on on behalf of the state completely, and uh, uh, showed showed us through that entire process that even the Israeli courts are implicated in uh, in the uh, occupation, are complicit in the occupation and what's happening there. Um, but what it, it did allow us opportunities to gather much more information and to hear directly from soldiers. But, you know, the whole, in, in that kind of legal effort, um, the state is doing everything it can to defend itself, the state of Israel, not searching for the truth, which is what Craig and I hoped for. So we gathered a lot of info, um, but there was never accountability. There was never a thorough, credible, transparent investigation. It's a position of the U.S. government that was confirmed by um, uh, Tony Blinken, now Secretary of State Blinken. That was confirmed in a meeting that we had with him in 2010 in Jerusalem. And uh, and that's never changed. So, um, and we received um, incredible uh, messages, a letter from an official at the State Department, Michelle Bernier-Toth, who uh, wrote in 2008 
and, li and talked about all of the high-level American officials who had approached their counterparts in Israel about Rachel's case with questions and uh, questions about investigation. And she said, our questions and requests go unanswered or ignored by Israel. And so, uh, so there were these efforts all along the way and we are grateful for those, but the follow through never happened. There were never consequences. And even when we um, brought our legal case, that was not against an individual Israeli soldier. Um, it was against the Israeli military and the Israeli government. And that's really what need, we need to see change is we need to see those institutions impacted um, by um, actions on the part of our own government. I think the last time we actually were in the State Department was in 2015. Yeah. We were talking to then Deputy Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. And uh, I remember t towards when we were leaving, you know, I thanked him. I said, you know, I'm glad you're caring. I'm glad you're a decent person. I'm glad you're caring about our family. But unless you engage your institution, unless you bring the full power of the State Department to bear, you don't do me any good. It doesn't, it doesn't help. It's, it, it's nice, but it doesn't help. I hope that, I'm sure he doesn't remember those words, but I hope he, he thinks about that feeling. Cindy, Craig, um, thank you, really from the bottom of my heart uh, for taking the time to, to talk to me. Um, I also have the feeling that Israel killing, I mean, killing Palestinians, unfortunately, you know, they've been so dehumanized over the years that you feel like the Western media um, is, is not really, you know, doesn't really care about them. But uh, I also think Israel is trying to send a message by killing Rachel, Tom, uh, Aishino now, by killing uh, also a, a U.S. citizen on the, on the Mavi Mamara, the, the boat of the flotilla. You know, Israel is trying to send a message to, you know, people fighting for justice, um, you know, don't come, you are at risk. You are also at risk. And, uh, but I think the, um, the solidarity movement is, is, is very powerful and is so beautiful that um, hopefully, um, you know, it'll bring justice to the Palestinians one day or another. So, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Cindy, and thank you, Craig. Thank you for having us. Um, thank you for having I'm us. reacting to what you said because of the list of people that you have there, and there are more, Shireen Abba Akla uh, uh, jumps to mind. But oh, Rachel was the first, and the lack of... A strong statement in Rachel's case, I think, allowed those others to be killed. So when people thought we were fighting for justice for Rachel, we were fighting for justice for all those other people, but we didn't know their names yet. And and now who are we fighting for? We don't know their names, but and certainly for the Palestinian people. I mean, that's at the end of the time, that's what we're trying to do is is help these people to live. And uh, I would just add, thank you, know, you both. Oh, sorry. The people in the region. I mean, we're we have very close connections to comrades in inside forty eight inside Israel who are also working for the same thing, even during these really difficult times there. So, uh, thank you for giving us an opportunity to talk about that. <laughs> thank you to you both. Thanks.